Hey guys, our next exploration is the season of Lent. We're calling this On the Trail to Skull Hill. Skull Hill was the place of Jesus' crucifixion. In its day, this place was called Golgotha, which means the skull or the place of the skull. Why was this place called Skull Hill? Well, if you take a look, this is Skull Hill. This is what the site looked like. And as you can see, well, from one angle, this looks definitely like a, a skull. It was a bald hilltop. And this is where they often had crucifixions. It's where Jesus took his cross and died. So the cross, this instrument of Roman torture, remember Jesus was handed over by the Jewish authorities to Pontius Pilate, who found nothing wrong with him. And yet still on the day of Passover, executed Jesus on this most gruesome torture device, this capital punishment that was just utter, complete humiliation. It was a a way of dying with your arms held out, nailed, and eventually, from what I understand, it was normally a, a slow and painful death, obviously painful, nails in your feet, nails in your hands, or lashed, but you would eventually die of asphyxiation and the inability to pull, pull yourself up to take a breath. It was a humiliating and painful way to go, and really the ultimate sign of, of dishonor. Why are we journeying to this hill where the cross was? What is this season about? Let me give you some words from John Stott. If the cross of Christ bring anything to mind, it is surely everything, the most profound reality and the sublimest mystery. Our hope is to approach the cross of Christ with this kind of adoration, this kind of awareness of the mystery that what happened there is the most important thing that's ever happened. God become flesh, died for us. God in Christ in man on the cross, atoning for our sins. So thus we journey to this cross, hoping to understand more of not only how to follow Christ, but how to see his heart for us, to cherish it and to respond to it. So this whole season in the high church calendar, it's called Lent. And Lent is a season that approaches the cross from Ash Wednesday all the way to Easter Sunday. It's a 40-day season, and that's the focus of this series on the trail to Skull Hill. It's really discipleship is a journey to the cross. And that's what we hope to do during this season, is to approach the cross using some of the, the traditions of Lent in order to help us capture the beauty, the mystery, the subtlety, the overwhelming reality of the cross and experience it and experience God in our lives today. Don't you think the cross is a bit of an odd symbol for a community of faith to use as their key way of identifying themselves? Well, here's John Stott again wrestling with that question. The community of Christ is the community of the cross. Having been brought into being by the cross, it continues to live by and under the cross. Our perspective and our behavior are now governed by the cross. All our relationships have been radically transformed by it. The cross is not just a badge to identify us and the banner under which we march. It is also the compass that gives us our bearings in a disoriented world. And so in this Lenten season, we approach the cross as our heading, the place we're embarking to. As we go on the trail to Skull Hill, we fix our eyes on the one who died for us. What are you signing up for on the trail to Skull Hill? How is this going to transform you? What kind of new bearings is this going to give you? Well, let's look at 
start again, Christians who at Christ's cross have found their pride broken, their guilt expunged, their love kindled, their hope restored, and their character transformed. Are you ready for that? Are you ready to have your pride broken? Are you ready to have your guilt expunged? Are you ready for your love to be kindled? Are you ready to have your hope restored? And are you ready to have your character transformed? This is what we're signing up for when we follow Jesus on the trail to Skull Hill, when we give our lives to following Christ. Are you in? The first of these images on the way to Easter that we're looking at is something that traditionally announces, begins the season of Lent. They call it Ash Wednesday. During Ash Wednesday, ashes are put on the forehead in the shape of a cross. So what are these ashes all about? In the scriptures, you'll often find these things together, dust and ashes. Dust and ashes become a word pair that, that get repeated in some interesting places. And maybe one of the reasons they're often hanging out together is their sonic similarity. So it's, it's almost this poetic turn of phrase, like Abraham saying in Genesis chapter 18, but I am but dust and ashes. Va'anoki afer va'efer. Afer va'efer. So dust and ashes. It, it's a word pair that has kind of a musical cadence to it in the Hebrew. But why are these words and concepts hanging out together? What's the deal with dust and ashes? Why would Abraham say to God this word pair? We're going to look at a couple of uses of this word pair throughout the scriptures, this idea of dust and ashes. Maybe it'll shed light on how this can help us approach the cross. So Job, he says this in chapter 42. He after encountering the utter amazing presence of God, after his complaint to God, God appears and, and, and kind of just overwhelms Job with the reality that he is the creator. And Job's response is this. And so now I rebuke myself and repent in dust and ashes. Given the amazing, glorious revelation of God to Job, and his response of, of rebuking himself and, and, and admitting his status as dust and ashes. How are we dust and ashes? You know, Abraham says the same thing as I just mentioned. After an encounter with God's amazing strength, he says this, I shall speak to my Lord since I am but dust and ashes. This direct speech to God in both of these cases, why are they calling themselves dust and ashes? Well, they're just remembering their createdness. So that word for dust and ashes that get dovetailed together, well, you know the story of humanity's creation. In the biblical narrative, God reaches into the dust to form us. Then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living being. For the first man, Adam, this is where he came from, from dust. He owes his entire existence to God's creative love. That is indeed one of the responses that we need when we approach the cross. Remembering our humanity, remembering our createdness, and thus our mortality. From dust we come and to dust we return. And so any hope of the resurrection of what we see on the other side of the cross, it all comes from God. We need God to give us life. Remember that. So dust and ashes are a symbol of our createdness. They're a symbol of our repentance, of our turning toward God and remembering that He is indeed God, our Creator. Turn to God. On this Ash Wednesday, turn to God as you are made of dust.
and so to engage the imagery of Ash Wednesday and to prepare our hearts for this journey to Skull Hill. Here's a spiritual practice to consider. Take some time to pray Psalm 90. While you are praying, remember you are created from dust. Approach him accordingly in humility and awareness of your createdness. Some things to journal, to discuss. How does it change your posture to remember your createdness? Discuss or journal about your awareness of God as creator when we remember our status as dust and ashes made by God. How does this change your love, affection, appreciation, and awe of God? How do ashes point you to the cross of Christ? The ashes remind us of our humanity and of God's life-giving heart for you.